The following program does not necessarily represent the views of the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Welcome to this edition of Joy in Our Town. I'm Ann Farrell Tata, your host, and I'm delighted today to welcome my guest, Dr. Eddie McLaughlin. Dr. McLaughlin is an emergency medicine physician, and our issue today is family, and we're going to be talking about winter health. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. So, Dr. McLaughlin, you are a local doctor. You were born and raised here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into becoming an ER physician? So, yeah, I um, lived here since junior high school and went to the College of William and Mary and then trained, uh, went to medical school at Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk and then uh, also did my emergency medicine residency training in Norfolk as well and then joined uh, emergency physicians of Tidewater where I've worked for the last 15 years here in, in Tidewater, mostly in Virginia Beach but we also staff some ERs in Norfolk and Suffolk. Now you you work the night shift, right? So you probably see all kinds of things. What what kind of changes have you seen over the last 15 years in emergency medicine? Well, there's been quite a few changes. Emergency medicine is a relatively young specialty. Uh, we've been in existence for about 40 years, and my group is um, um, some of the older guys in my group have been there from the beginning, and we have uh, uh, we we also um, serve as faculty at and run a uh, residency training center at the medical school. Um, but the changes we've seen have been uh, unbelievable just in my 15 years. Um, not only just the um, evidence-based medicine where we're actually um, treating people, uh, you know, better studies, better therapies, but also the electronic medical record has uh, been a huge um, plus in terms of just access to information about the patients and our ability to treat them you know, you know, expediently. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful thing. Was that something you guys had to learn? You had to go back to training? To... Well, I had to learn how to type, yeah. uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but no, it's been great. As, the, as an emergency medicine doctor, you're in the middle um, between primary care offices and the hospital, and so it's a fantastic tool to be able to access what's happened to the patient in the primary care office and then also be able to access what's happened in the hospital, say the last time they were in the hospital, and have all that information at your fingertips. Wow, to, that's a great tool. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Uh, but definitely have to, uh, we used to the dictate all part, our char yeah. charts now, but I'm, I'm a much faster typer than I was five years ago. Well, that's good, that's <laughs> good. Okay, so flu season is upon us, and um, what do you, what are the guidelines? And Because that, that's another thing that seems to change year to year, and the medicines change. Yeah, so it's constant um, um, chasing of the flu vaccine, and is it going to be a really virulent uh, strain, um, or are we going to have a light season? This year it seems to be, we haven't seen much flu in the area yet. There's been a few sporadic cases. Uh, usually once you start seeing a few cases, it's not long before it, it kind of spreads widespread through the community. It's not supposed to be a really bad year, but definitely recommend the flu shot for everybody, no question. All ages? That's uh, another, yeah, that's good. All ages and they're special, especially certain high risk groups, you know, right. children and pregnant ladies and older uh, folks uh, definitely recommend to get that. Um, there's really no downside to it at all and it, it, it will stem the tide of the flu in the community. Now is there a time that it's too late to get a flu shot and is it, is it too early? What, what is the season? To no, we should, you should be looking to get your flu shot uh, as soon as you can right now before the flu hits. Um, but uh, it's never, it's, we will see flu all the way into the spring so it's never too late to get that. So during the winter months, like what kind of things do you see in the ER that you that are seasonal versus other times of the year? Sure. So um, cold and flu season is the big thing. We see a big upswing in respiratory illnesses and viral illnesses such as the flu. Um, 
you know, it's because everybody's inside, it's cold, you know, kids are in school, people are, you know, inside with the heat on and the, just the transmission is uh, much more common or much easier between people and uh, the main things are just to try to, uh, you know, cough into your elbow, wash your hands frequently, all those kind of respiratory hygiene things that we talk about um, to prevent transmission from friends, family, colleagues, classmates, all that. Well, and that brings me to another question because I've had four children who have gone through college and freshman year, every one of mine just got, stayed sick the whole freshman year. Is it because they're staying out too late or up too late or is it from close quarters in a dorm or <laughs> all of is something above, else going on? All of the above, uh, yeah, they're probably uh, not taking care of themselves, staying up late for hopefully studying, but maybe other things. Um, and. Uh, yeah, you're, you're clustered again with um, lots, just like when they're kids and first going to school, they're exposed to a lot of different viruses and uh, in close quarters with other children and, and you, your immune system has to be exposed to all those viruses. So same kind of thing happens again in college and or military barracks or that kind of thing oh, yeah. where people are put in close quarters, especially this time of year. Do you treat a lot of the military? And or the spouses? Yeah, so we see a, a large uh, population of military folks in the ER uh, in Tidewater. Uh, mostly military are healthy um, folks, and uh, but they get hit with the same things that everybody else does. Uh, How about uh, stress from, you know, when their um, spouses are deployed? Do you see, you know, like emotional people, I mean, coming in for emotional reasons? Sure. The, um, Military is big. Um, there's so much stress around the holidays, um, especially in the military community, where um, a spouse may be caring for the whole family while their loved one is deployed and, and not available. And you know, many of the military families are removed from their support system. They may be from Indiana or Iowa, and they've moved here with their spouse, and who's then deployed, and they have really don't have a great support system. So. Uh, a very uh, large amount of stress on, on these folks who are just kind of stretched thin, carrying the load while their loved ones are uh, defending us and around the world. Well, do you have counselors that you recommend, or how do you, I mean, because you're, you probably are like a primary care doctor to a lot of people, well, we whether you want to be or not. <laughs> well, the emergency room is, you know, it's, I call it the front lines of humanity. We, we see um, everything comes through the door in the emergency department. Uh, we, we don't have, I don't think the, you know, the emergency room can't be everything to everybody, though. The Navy certainly has a lot of resources, or the military has a lot of resources for families and uh, stress, and um, and we try to refer those folks back to that because it's a great resource. Um, the bigger problem is, you know, folks who are uninsured, who, you know, st still having a lot of stress. I mean, so much of what comes through the door in the emergency department can be stress-related, wow. anxiety, depression. Um, Yes, financial stresses, and you know that those things take a real toll on people. Right. And um, many times, it's I find myself sitting down, pulling up a chair, and talking about those yeah. things. Not necessarily the medicine, but more of the stress and and coping strategies. But uh, clearly, we don't have a lot of time to, right. to spend doing that kind of work. But we certainly see a lot of folks who are uh, st with stress-related issues coming into the emergency department. So do you have a lot of um, hypochondriacs, like people that you're, they're repeaters? Do you have those kind of patients? Sure. You, you do have. they try to avoid you or do they try to find you? That well, knowing that you're going to sit down with them, they might want to look for you. They don't know. Hopefully they don't know my schedule. But yeah, um, you know, especially, like I said, folks who may be uninsured, who don't have access to primary care, or the, the reality is um, often primary care practices are um, overstretched and you know patients try to get into their doctor and say well you know they couldn't see me for a couple weeks and so I came here um, the emergency department is uh, it's really the place you want to go if you have an you know if you have an immediate question you have an immediate problem you're going to get most of the time you're going to get answers we can do the diagnostics and um, come to a lot of times come to a, a a diagnosis and a treatment plan a lot quicker than uh, maybe your primary care doctor could because of you know it's just 
uh, stretched out, so to speak, where we kind of condense all of those things. And uh, that's why I think people, you're asking if I've seen changes through the years. I mean, we, everybody through the years says, you know, oh, we're going to decrease emergency room visits and because they're inefficient and we've never seen a decrease in volume in the 15 years that I've been practicing. Have you seen increases? Yeah, every year the volumes in the ER go up and up. Um, and it's because of that, because people like that immediate access, immediate answers to questions that we can get the tests, we can get the, um, we can get to the answer and get to the treatment in a condensed fashion. Well, and working at night, is, do you see different things than they see during the day, or, or are they similar, or how, how does that differ? Because you've worked both, right? Yes. So sure, you know, uh, sometimes you can't believe what comes in at, at 3.30 in the morning that, you know, certainly could have waited to another time, but... Uh, like a hangnail? Yeah, right. Do you see some really, do you think they just couldn't sleep? Well, sometimes, in, and I'll, every once in a while I'll get just curious and ask, well, why, you know, yeah. why your knee you has been hurting morning? for a month, why, why did you wait, <laughs> why did you come in at 3? And sometimes you get the answer, well, I knew it wouldn't be so busy, so I Oh, came yeah. Well, so it's hard to argue with that. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, we tend to see the more acute things, you know, so uh, if somebody's having a heart attack or a stroke or, uh, you know, a legitimate true emergency, you know, as opposed to uh, they're not going to just usually wake up in the middle of sleep to come to the emergency department. So we tend to see, you know, more of the real emergencies come in overnight. And then, of course, you see a lot of the alcohol and substance abuse oh, yeah. problems and, and car crashes and things that happen after hours once yeah. the bars let out and uh, that kind of thing. And does it, is it, um, do you see more, like are, are there more uh, car accidents or alcohol related things at around the holiday season and winter? Well, sure, I, yeah, I, I definitely think there are as people dealing with stress and family issues and you know, you know, holidays aren't always necessarily the happiest times for everybody because of uh, different family dynamics and um, so people, you know, overindulge with um, uh, alcohol or what, what have you and so we, we, do, we definitely see a lot of that in the emergency department. It's the, it's the, the emergency department, you have to remember, is we see all comers. So yeah. you don't turn anyone away. Right. Regardless of your ability to pay yeah. uh, or who you are, you're going to be seen in the emergency department. Um, you know, we may, we, again, we can't be everything to everybody, um, but we're going to evaluate you and, right. and, and help you, you know, get to the resources that you need, even if it's not an emergent problem. And do you, can you give, we only have about two minutes left for this um, segment, but do you have some tips for staying healthy in the winter months so, besides get your flu shot? Yeah, get your flu shot. And then I think the main things are just take care of yourself. Um, th this sounds cliche or obvious, but so many of the things we see in the emergency department are related to self-destructive behavior or not, health, not doing healthy uh, habits, you know, some exercise, eating right, taking care of your emotional self, and um, and those things. You know, I find people come in and they want a pill. Yeah. You know, I'm stressed. I'm anxious. I've got these problems. What can you prescribe me? I've been sometimes the nurses uh, laugh at me because I've been known to write on a prescription. Uh, Exercise, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> certain good, things though. like that, and and uh, you know because just to try to kind of get that message through the people that right. it's there's lots of other healthy things you can be doing besides a, a prescription for another pill. How do you not get kind of frustrated sometimes, like you know, and just lose it? <laughs> it is frustrating because because <laughs> you, you can't do that, yeah, but yeah, and and you see people you know with whether it's smoking or alcohol or um, you know whatever the bad habits are and, you, and you, tr you try to take that window in time and impress upon them that yeah. the reason you're having these issues are you know self-induced frequently um, and so you know I don't know how many people actually listen to the advice uh, but you, you got to that's my job. I've well, you're, at least. you're kind. You, you probably say it very gently. <laughs> um, we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we are going to continue our conversation and talk about family emergencies. I'm Ann Farrell Tata. We're talking to Dr. Eddie McLaughlin, and we'll be right back. 
Hello and welcome back to this edition of Joy in Our Town. I'm Ann Farrell Tata, your host, and I've been joined today by Dr. Eddie McLaughlin, who is an emergency medicine physician. And our issue is family, and we are gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about some family emergencies. So welcome back. Thanks Thank for you. being here. So let's talk about when a family goes into the ER. I mean, you know, everyone knows they're long, they have to wait forever, or it seems like we have to wait. What is going on when a family arrives at the ER? So the emergency room, um, is a complex place. Um, we have to, um, you know, triage people and take care of the sickest people first. So often when you come into the emergency room, you know, everybody's particular problem seems like it's the most important and we don't want to dismiss that, but we have to triage and we have now, to... who determines that? Who determines who's the sickest? So the, at the tr when you come into the emergency department, you'll come into a triage area and there'll be a registered nurse who will take your vitals, basically get the basic complaint and give you a score, one to five, and one being the, mo the most sick and five being, you know, the least. Um, and, and then we kind of prioritize those folks and if it's very busy, you know, we're going to be taking care of the um, the the most critically ill and injured first and then uh, sorting back to who can wait. Um, the ideal though is to be able to kind of what we call um, um, take care of both populations, uh, split flow management. So, you know, we want, we don't want you to wait in the waiting room for two and three and four hours, you know, just because you don't necessarily have the most urgent problem. So most of our emergency departments we've kind of uh, we have kind of our acute care section and then we have more of a minor care section so we can flow people through both uh, areas and be efficient um, you know just whether you're having a heart attack or whether you have a sprained wrist um, so but certainly there are times where the emergency department can get overwhelmed and you may have to wait a little bit but just know people sometimes get upset because you know hey I got here before that yeah. person and they went back first what the heck's going on it's because they have a more urgent problem right but like you said everyone thinks their problem is the most emergency sure. so are you assigned um, you know like the acute side or the uh, you know or, or do you take care of both Are you going back and forth so um, I work primarily at Princess Anne emergency department but some other emergency departments too and we have um, multiple physicians as well as um, um, physician assistants working um, who we supervise maybe in the in the minor area who are, who are very competent and that we work side by side with but you know who can take care of the sore throats and the colds and the, um, the more minor lacerations and things um, but I'm the the physician is supervising both, all of those areas uh, and, and in the busy emergency departments most of the time we have three or four physicians working at you know overlapping shifts uh, and then as the night goes on I start to lose some of my colleagues and I'm on my own you know for you know from about one o'clock till seven. And what, what about um, do you have non-speaking patients come in what happens with with people that can't speak English? So that's a great question. Uh, we have actually fantastic resources now with um, language interpreters. Um, that are on call or that are actually on working? Yeah, so we, sometimes we have somebody on staff who may can help translate, but frequently we use these language lines that um, two-way phone where we can just communicate um, through they just get, an get interpreter. On the phone? Oh, yeah. wow. Um, then we also have, uh, I just had a patient who was deaf couple nights ago oh, wow. and we have a um, it's like a robot screen TV two-way video conference that we call up a someone who can do sign, uh, language. sign language and, wow. and communicate so they're actually seeing somebody on the video right. it's a two-way yeah so we can communicate and where are they are they at Norfolk General or one yeah. of the main other hospitals well each ER has the has the capabilities and then you call into a language line or interpreter line and then they come up on the that's screen amazing. and help you communicate yeah so. so that's another thing that's changed over the last 15 years all the technology that has made your job easier yeah technology has um, has really especially in there's certain uh, stroke programs where you you can have a neurologist instantaneously on one of these two-way video oh. conferences so you need to be making some decisions about uh, stroke treatment where you're giving uh, clot busting drugs and you can have a neurologist you know actually see the patient and, and assist amazing. you with that with those decisions in real time so they don't have to come in anymore well it's 
they, they, you still may have them come in, but a lot of these like stroke and heart attack situations, they you have, have a narrow window yeah. to administer the drug safely and have the best outcome. But once you get beyond a three or four and a half hour window in many of these protocols, you've missed it and it's too late to give the drug or it's too dangerous at that point or it won't have its desired effect. So we have a lot of protocols, whether it's for stroke or heart attack or trauma, where we're doing a lot of things really rapidly. You'll see <clears throat> when families come to the emergency department, if, they, you know, if there's someone who has chest pain, you know, we're, our goal is to get an EKG within six minutes. If they're having stroke symptoms, they're going to be seen by the doctor within five to ten minutes and, and get their care initiated. So um, these kind of time-dependent emergencies, we've really kind of worked out these just streamlined processes to get you taken care of. No, um, you're not a trauma center, right? Not at Princess Anne. The two trauma centers are Virginia Beach General and Norfolk General. So, if do people actually come to you and you have to send them, or do they, or do? Well, you, if they come in an ambulance, then they know um, not to bring they, them there. They, they generally are direct to the trauma centers, or they'll call us and see if it's appropriate, and we may divert them to the trauma center. That's another good thing that I should make a point of is. Folks should, if they have chest pain or yeah. stroke-like symptoms, don't be hesitant to call an ambulance. That's oh, what yeah. they're there for, yeah. and that's going to get you to care as quick as possible. Um, you know, often I see uh, families will bring in their loved one with chest pain or stroke symptoms, and you know, th there's not a whole lot you can do for your family member if they have a cardiac arrest in the car. Right. Whereas if the fair, if they have a cardiac arrest or something goes on in the in the ambulance with paramedics who can intervene. So, um, you know, all too often I see families reluctant to call the ambulance. But you do see the other side too, where people call the ambulance for minor complaints too. There's hypochondriacs. Yeah. That so, but that is, it's it's hard to know what what is. You know, you, you don't want to bother people and all that. I can understand how people would be reluctant <clears throat> to call. How, how do you know what is real? Well, and, and sometimes it's hard. Is this indigestion or is this yeah, a heart attack? Right. Uh, and I would say if when it comes to things like cardiac, uh, you know, if you have risk factors for cardiac or we, we're at a certain age, uh, yeah. you know, you're more likely hey, that, whoa there. That, <laughs> that that is that may be cardiac. And if it ends up being indigestion or something minor, that's okay. But, right. Um, I've even seen some of my physician colleagues drive themselves to the ER, oh, wow. um, you know, when they're having legitimate cardiac problems, yeah. you know, and, which it just seems, um, you know, foolish to do that. Right. Um, so use use EMS um, with the, you know, true emergent problems. You know, somebody passes out, somebody has weakness or difficulty speaking, or, you know, chest pain that's unusual and significant, uh, call the ambulance. Yeah. <coughs> have you ever treated, or when you're on duty, have you treated somebody, you know, you know that has come in the ER? Occasionally, you know, having grown up in Virginia yeah, Beach, yeah, that's what I was uh, thinking. And, and it always was a little uncomfortable um, to do that. You know, it makes it pretty stressful. Uh, but they're probably relieved. Well, I'd be relieved if I saw you there. <laughs> yeah, someone I know. Well, that's what I say to people: is you never want to look up and see me in the <laughs> emergency room. But uh, no, so that has happened um, from time to time. And uh, do you treat them? I mean, can you treat them? It's not like the judge where you ha or a lawyer you have to. Recuse yourself, right? You know, conflict of interest. No, it, sometimes if it's uh, if it's not emergent, I might have one of my partners like, hey, I know that person. It's a little bit strange. Have them uh, see them instead of me. But if it's you know a true emergency, you, you got to charge right in there. And no, I'm sure there. Are, you know, you've seen a lot of heartaches. And how how do you handle you know delivering the bad news to a family? That's got to be one of your toughest. The toughest yeah, that, parts that of your that job. That is a t that is a tough one. And every family kind of uh, has their own way of. Uh, reacting and receiving bad news. You've seen kind of all over the board, I imagine. Yeah, so, uh, you know, especially around the holidays, if, you know, if, if you have someone who's, you know, if you, um, whether it's a cardiac arrest or somebody who's passed away and you have to deliver news to the family, you know, uh, and on the night shift, I don't have as many resources like a chaplain or yeah. a nurse manager or somebody who can go in. Um, so you kind of try to bring, you know, a nurse in with you and, you know, do it and have people sit down and do it and uh, I, I like to be direct though, yeah. you know, because it's, uh, 
Well, you have to be, I guess. Yeah, since no reason to not to beat around the bush with these things, but uh, it's, there's no there's no formula. It's just um, try to be kind and caring and um, listen to what they're going through. Uh, but it it can be tough. And the other thing that that's really hard in emergency medicine is not uncommon. Every shift or two. You know, I'll do a CAT scan on somebody who's got a kidney stone, and then we see cancer, oh, gosh, or some, yeah. you know, something that was totally unexpected, right. and now you've got to deliver that news. So that can be uh, tough too, especially if you don't have a relationship with. Um, right. You know, if you just met this person a couple hours ago, and now you're going to tell them some bad news. So you try to get, you know, family around, and try to get. Um, you know, involve their primary care physician, you know, at least by phone and yeah. coordinate their care. Uh, but it can be tough, especially around the holidays. Well, and we have a few minutes left, but I want you to share your story because you also have the flip side of that is you have very rewarding things. And you had a patient, a young guy that came in and with the cardiac arrest. Yeah, so that is the, you know, I'm blessed. I love my job. I get to go in and try to intervene in folks' lives at, you know, critical times. Um, and there's certainly, you know, as many tragedies and um, times that you have to deliver bad news, there's plenty of times where you actually get to make a difference. And um, and that's, that's, I feel blessed to be able to do that. The one case that sticks in my mind in the last year or two was a, a young guy who was very fit. He was an athletic trainer. And his girlfriend kind of was like, felt his chest and there was all these abnormal heart uh, rhythm beats and and she was concerned and he was feeling lightheaded and dizzy and uh, literally within a couple minutes of me interviewing him talking to him he looked like a you know just a fantastic athlete he went into flatline cardiac arrest asystole in front of my eyes and um, you know it was, it was fantastic that his girlfriend like forced him to come in because he had a congenital heart um, rhythm problem and uh, we were able to resuscitate him and he made a full recovery. He ended up with a pacemaker and a defibrillator but he uh, he ended up making a full recovery and did, did really well. Did he not know that he had this? No, it was completely general? out of the blue. He'd had a couple episodes where he'd passed out that he'd kind of just dismissed um, but and, and I don't know it's, it seems so lucky that he went into this yeah. uh, a systolic heart rhythm right in front of our eyes that we were able to be there because he very well could have happened outside of the hospital and he would not have survived. And so now, now he's he'll be able to live a, a healthy life. Yeah, and so again, technology is amazing. Cardiac care is amazing. So he he's got to deal with a little pacemaker under his collarbone or yeah, a defibrillator, but it's keeping he's his heart beating. Yeah. So that's he's going to live a normal life. So. That's got to be so. The again, the rewarding side of what you do. Yeah, those those. You know that is uh, that is why I went into it. The other thing that I've enjoy is the detective work and the figuring out the diagnosis and the, uh, putting the pieces together and, and and solving the the riddle and and actually coming up with the diagnosis and then the treatment flows from there. But yeah. being the first guy to have a crack at. Uh, uh, making the diagnosis is just great. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. We've been joined by Dr. Eddie McLaughlin. I'm Ann Farrell Tata. We'll see you next time on Join Our Town. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and made possible by your telethon dollars. Your continual support can keep Joy in Our Town brought to your home every day. So write Joy.